Jigurdiv. Jordan Peterson is a psychologist, an author, and one of the world's most famous intellectuals. And one of the things that he often does, especially in the religious domain, is analyze, um, look for symbolism, archetypes, uh, finding deeper meaning in the biblical stories in order to find constructive ways or constructive lessons that he can extract from this to inform the way we should be living our lives. And he is um, very popular for it. And it is something that I lo will look to be emulating in today's video. So essentially what I mean by that is, is that it doesn't matter to me whether he does a good or bad job doing it. I appreciate the fact that he does it. I think that deeper thinking or deeper analysis or depth in general in the religious landscape is something that is sorely missing. And so someone who is using their um, background as a psychologist, their wider reading and whatever else to dive into this in order to extract as much meaning, as much truth from these texts as can be extracted. And I'm going to get to what exactly I mean by that, because I believe that there are various different domains of truth that one can extract from a text such as the Bible. Um, I believe the same thing can and ought to be done in other, uh, let's say, religions and religious texts as well. And so what I want to do is essentially do the exact same thing that he often does for the biblical canon with the Bhagavad Gita to show not only the immense truth and, and, and wisdom that the Bhagavad Gita contains, but also to break this notion that, you know, the Bible contains exclusive revelations about human nature, that it has profundity and depth in an exclusive way that no one else does or nothing else does in the religious landscape, that the West and Western philosophers and Western uh, axioms of thought are exclusively profound or exclusively um, able to elucidate these subtle points and, and deep points that are able to then inform society in a way that, again, no other traditional culture can. I think these things are held, these are viewpoints that are perhaps um, subliminally held by certain people. And I think that needs to be challenged. And I aim, I aim to do so with today's video. And so I'm not so much refuting Jordan Peterson or, or correcting Jordan Peterson, but rather mirroring Jordan Peterson, in a sense, mimicking Jordan Peterson, but in a different way. Instead of using the Bible, I'll be using the Bhagavad Gita and the framework of Vaishnava and Hindu thought. Now, in order to go ahead with this, I would need to explain to you briefly what phenomenology is. The reason for that is because there are different domains of truth. There is truth as we know it empirically or literally, historically perhaps falls into that category. There is truth that is termed as metaphysical, which is beyond what we can know and perceive in this world, uh, foundational perhaps to this world. And then there is phenomenological truth, which is the, the realm of subjective experience or truth as an experience of something, even if that something may, pot may potentially not fall under the category of empirical literal truth. Now, for phenomenologists, everything that you experience is real. So everything that you're experiencing inside of yourself, in your mind, is a real thing. Um, and causality is, to an extent, irrelevant. So what causes you to feel that, if that is in of itself true or not, is a secondary uh, point of discussion. And so phenomenology deals with what matters much more than it deals with matter, if that makes sense. Um, and what it aims to do is to analyze the structure of human experience, the structure of subjective experience. And then what happens is as you begin to, to study subjective human experience, you start to draw out patterns, commonalities. So one person's subjective experience, another person's subjective experience, another person's subjective experience. And as you analyze all of this, you draw out structures and patterns for how this shapes um, what we understand as the human experiential canon. And that means emotions, like the, the range of emotions that a human being is able to experience. We have sort of canonical emotions. And the reason we have this, and the reason this is important is because it's what allows us to make uh, assumptions about each other. So that we, we know that when I say the word uh, excitement, that the person who I'm saying it to understands what I mean by that word because we have the same experience of excitement. That which I describe as excitement is a canonical human subjective experience that you have also had. If we were not to have 
these commonalities, these canonical experiences that shape, that are ultimately subjective, but can be um, termed as universal truths about human experience, if we were to not have them, we would spend all our time in conversation simply explaining ourselves infinitely, because there would be no point of reference or relatability between two individuals. So it's very important that phenomenology establishes this common ground of human experience, despite your experience and my experience being ultimately subjective. And so this, this uh, starts to, let's say, expose patterns. So human patterns of experience, patterns of conduct, patterns of behavior, structures, as I said previously. Um, so let me give you an example uh, of that. If you take a fruit or any food item, if you study it, if you observe it in of itself, then you are essentially dealing with what Immanuel Kant said is the noumena. So noumena means an object in of itself. So independent of an observer or independent of an experiencer. And so you can ascertain certain things about it in that capacity. And then you have in opposition to the noumena, the phenomena, which is that is that, that object experienced as you see it. So that what I mean by that is that we see lemon as being a lemon for as being yellow, we taste it as being sour, but that is our subjective experience, our interaction with the object known as a lemon. Now, Immanuel Kant, for example, he uh, argued that you cannot actually ascertain the noumena, you cannot know what a thing is independent from the one attempting to know it, the one observing it or experiencing it because of the biases involved in every descriptive capacity that we would have, every analytical endeavor that we would make would be biased by our own subjective experiences, our subjective context, etc. So you could never truly know what something is independent of the one trying to know it, if that makes sense. That's Immanuel Kant's proposition. Now, for the phenomenologist, therefore, we're more interested in, in the world as it appears to us rather than in the world as it actually is. Because there is this understanding that to know the world as it factually is, is to an extent impossible. We can only structure it by the perceived commonalities of the experiences of the various individuals and then contextualize that by the individual subjective experiences that each one of us has that adds nuance to the otherwise, let's say, um, standard universal uh, canon that we establish about human experience and human uh, interaction with the world. So, okay, without further ado, I think it's best if we just dive into this and we can start to break down the points that he makes as we progress through the video but i wanted to give that brief introduction to phenomenology even if it sounds complex this is in a sense the most simplified it can get for us to understand that what jordan peterson often does and what i believe to his credit that he does is he takes the biblical stories and rather than treating them as factual historical accounts although they may be and that is an important point to make. He says, what is the, the, what is being revealed about the structure of human conduct and human experience in these stories? What is the, the phenomena that can be observed? What is being extracted from that story when we interact with that story? So when you hear that story, when you read that story, what impact does it have on you? How does it inform you in terms of how you should behave and how you should live and how you should act in this world. So, so these types of things, and let's dive into it. The atheist types, the rationalist types, there's something they miss. And what they miss is that fiction isn't false. It's not a lie, right? It's not literal, but it's not a lie. And great fiction is true, but it never happened. So how can it be true? And the answer to that is something like, well, there are patterns in things, deep patterns, deep recurring patterns. You know, human nature, the fact that we're human, that, that the humanity itself is a recurring pattern. It has characteristic shape. And great fiction describes the shape of that pattern. And the greatest of fiction, the greater fiction becomes, the more it is religious in nature. And that's not even a a claim about the nature of truth. It's more a claim about the nature of experience. 
you know, when we say something is profound, what we mean is that it's moving and that it has a broad influence. It's capable of having a broad influence on the way we think and see and act. So here Jordan Peterson makes um, a point that I believe is actually fundamental to this entire premise, which is that fiction isn't false. It's not a lie. It's just not literal. And and that is something that is sometimes um, difficult to understand. But what he's really hinting at here is that the only reason fiction works, especially, well, of course, the best kinds of fictions, the, the, the most revered fictions, the reason they work is because they speak to human nature and human experiences. Fictions, when they're good, are able to embody something that is so universal about our experience and our, and our nature as human beings that we can relate to it. We can identify ourselves with the characters in fiction. We can place ourselves in their shoes and very easily see ourselves experiencing what they're experiencing, making the choices that they are they are making on our behalf. And those experiences and those fictional circumstances and characters often inform us about how we should be acting. Because fiction can do one thing that empirical um, uh, events often often cannot, which is, I am living one life as an empirical individual. I'm living one life with one set of subjective experiences. And so are every other being in this, in this world. And so if we were to, let's say, collate all those experiences into one amalgamated figure, a fictional character that is able to embody the collective lessons learned from a bunch of individuals and then live out an ideal principle or an, an ideal life based on the collective lessons and, and mistakes that have been made and the, all the corrections that have worked throughout history of all these other individuals, that character might not exist as an actual individual, but he embodies the very real experiences and, and, and of, of all these empirical figures that I mentioned. So if, if that character has no factual reality, it doesn't mean that he doesn't have truth value to me because he is rooted in real things. All fictions are ultimately rooted in something real. Otherwise, we would have no way of comprehending the fiction. So as I said, this proposed fictional character that that is a, a joining of my experiences with, say, 10 others to take in bo on board all of our realizations, all of the mistakes that we have made, but all the corrections that we have made as well. If that individual is a representation of all those 10 essences, let's put it like this, into one and becomes therefore something akin to an ideal being, despite him being fictional, in some ways he is more real than anything else because he is, the, or than any individual person, because he is as real as 10 individual people put together. So he's containing the, the, the reality, the truth of 10 people and 10 people you know, speak more truths than one person in a sense. It's, it's, it's a weird way of putting it, but it's this idea that something fictional can embody something real and therefore can provide extreme value despite not being literally true. I hope to have made that somewhat clear. And in doing so, somebody might look at this and think, well, the very fact that I'm doing this video and that I'm saying these things about fiction, does it mean to suggest that Swami is... is claiming that the stories contained within Hindu traditions and Hindu scriptures are therefore fictional. So, no, I am not, okay? I am definitely not saying that. Um, I have no reason to say that. I have no reason to say to dismiss the stories of, of Hinduism as being not literal. I am just inviting us to perform the same um, subjective, analytical, interpretive endeavor that we are forced to do with fictional stories that we know to be fictional because they are authored by someone who says they are fictional in the sense that there is no empirical meaning that we can derive from it. And so we are forced to derive another meaning from it, interpretive, symbolic, whatever else. Um, I think that that's a forced scenario of interpretation and, symb and symbolic searching but I think we can do it voluntarily to real texts also. So if you take the Bible, it may well be an, an historical account of factual things. And that, that doesn't mean that you cannot perform the same interpretive analysis that someone like Jordan Peterson does to derive another layer of truth from the empirical truth that is already presented therein. The same thing can be done with the Bhagavad Gita. So I'm not making the claim that the Bhagavad Gita is, fic is fiction, so that I can then perform the symbolic and interpretive analysis of it. I'm saying that symbolic interpretive analysis can happen despite it being factual. Okay. Um, on the flip side, however, I would say 
that just because I believe that the events of Hindu scripture are mostly factual, that doesn't mean that I do so just because scripture says so. That's too childish and too cheap. So if someone were to to tend more towards interpreting them symbolically, and somebody were to refute that and say, no, but scripture says, how do you know that Krishna is real? Because scripture says Krishna is real. Um, I find that to be a little childish and naive. You have to follow the actual process by which people develop faith in these claims. Why did people believe Jesus Christ to begin with? Because they saw in him the embodiment of all that he claimed to be true. He made a series of claims. He acted them out. He walked the talk. So it wasn't that they believed the claims. They believed the person making the claims. And the claims therefore became believable because of the nature of the person making the claims. Okay. Now that isn't always true of every argument. So somebody who is... um, a very simple or even a bad person can make very good logical claims that can be assessed independent of the individual making the claim. Yeah, that's that's true. We don't have to go ad hominem in our this dissection of the value of a claim or not. But there is something to be understood about how religions come about. Why does the Buddha's claims hold value? Uh, why, does, why, why did Buddhism spring from one individual? Because they looked at him, the person, and understood that he embodied that which he was claiming. So he gave, he was the evidence himself for the things that he was attesting to. The same thing can be said about Christ. The same thing for me can be said in the Hindu context about mystics, yogis, spiritual masters, saints, such as my own guru, Paramahamsa Vishwananda. When I look at him, he embodies, he gives credence to the claims that I find in scripture. And so therefore, my faith in scripture is rooted in my real life experience of those which give credibility to the claims of scripture. So for example, Harry Potter, I may love Harry Potter and I may find a lot of interpretive value in Harry Potter, but I'm not going to believe the events of Harry Potter unless I would meet someone like Harry Potter that would be able to exhibit to me the fa- the, 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 the experiential, uh, evidential, let's say, um, demonstrations of the claims made therein right so it's something along those lines um and so blind faith and and blindly accepting things just because they're in a book that is labeled as holy uh that's not how these books came about and it's not how these traditions came about and so i think that we have to be fair on both sides of the coin um i do believe these stories of, of hindu scripture to be factual for the most part um but i don't believe them just because they're in a holy book and that needs to be understood as well as a sort of pretext to everything else that I will say in this video. You see, some Hindus are too scared to venture into symbolism because they want to avoid the, the, the idea that the Hindu gods and the Hindu stories are all myths. Because they equate myth with false, and they equate false or untruth with no value. And so they want to appeal to the empirical rational types and base their conception of truth on empirical evidence, uh, rational, factual events, and uh, personalities that can be traced and rooted, evidenced to in history. And so these are the evidentialists and they exist in, in predominantly Abrahamic traditions. And also I think that some Hindus tend to avoid the, the realm of symbolism and interpretation and subjective interpretation because they don't fully understand the, the whole spectrum of potential truth that Jordan Peterson is bringing across right now, um, such as phenomenology, metaphysics, etc. And so they think that if something never factually happened, it means it has no truth value. Um, and so hence they have this urgency to prove that Hindu scriptures are literally true. Um, that's one type of Hindu that you may encounter. You know, though they'll be pointing to evidences of the bridge between India and Sri Lanka as saying, you see, the Ramayana is factually true. And then they'll become proud of that because it's as if that adds an extra layer of, of value to it that it previously didn't have, which I'm not sure is true. Um, but that's another topic. Now, on the flip side, there are some Hindus who go too easily into the realm of symbolism and myth, especially myth, because they want to avoid having to contend with the extraordinary accounts that you find in Shastra. So if they were to be taken literally, yeah. So if you take, for example, um, 
the emergence of Lord Narasimha from the pillar. So in the story of Lord Narasimha, he is an incarnation of the, the Godhead, Narayana, that appears with a lion head and a human body, and he exits out of a pillar. So there's a demon king in a palace, and he basically challenges his son, who is a devotee of God, where is your God? And the son says, my God is everywhere. He is omnipresent, um, all-pervading. And the demon king says, is he in this pillar? And the boy says, yes, sure, he's everywhere. And so the demon king smashes the pillar to prove that God is not in there, and Narasimha springs out of the now cracked pillar um, with a lion head, human body, etc. And then he fights the demon king and defeats him and affirms, therefore, the, the claims and beliefs of his um, devotee. Now, again, as I said, those who jump to myth will take a story like that because there's so much symbolism that can be extracted from that story, undoubtedly. And so they'll say, let's not contend with this. Let's not even try to 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 pretend that this could be literally true and let's just relegate it to myth but then we can still extract a ton of meaning from it and great we have a tradition we have culture we have religion just it's mythology my issue with this is don't be too quick to jump on that bandwagon either because if you're saying that the reason you're going to call it myth is because you struggle to understand how it's possible that a being can come out of a pillar with a lion head and a human body, then I would posit that you are stripping away godness from God. You are limiting God and saying that you're taking away everything that makes God God, which is that he is capable of doing that which is otherwise not possible to be done because he is beyond the limitations and conditionings of material beings and material reality because he is the creator and transcendent to this reality. Therefore, don't be too quick to dismiss the supernatural claims, the the extraordinary claims of Hindu scripture uh, as a Hindu, because you don't want to come across as as sort of uh, lacking credibility or ungrounded because of just how extraordinary the claims are, because in doing so, you might be sabotaging yourself, cutting your own legs because you're stripping away, as I said, godness from God. And so, there's two sides to this coin. There is the Hindu that runs away from mythology because they want to pander to the empiricists saying, no, it has to be like this because they don't understand how something can still have true value if it didn't factually happen, that there's different kinds of truth. And then there's the other side, which is those who don't want to to contend with the possibility that these things actually happen because they think it makes them look crazy or or primitive or they don't know how to argue for it. Um, and so therefore they jump immediately to mythology um, and, and go too far in claiming that none of it is actually factually real. Um, but they, there is there is symbolical value in, in analyzing these things. And I think that the truth lies as a combination of the two, not even somewhere in the middle, but as a combination of the two. And that is, is that um, you should not dismiss these things as myth, contend with them as much as you can, um, accept them as being true in so far as you're reasonably capable of doing so, and extract all of the subjective interpretive Symbol, symbolic value that you can from them because then you'll be taking empirical historical truth one grounding it in metaphysical truths two and informing yourself about them through um, phenomenological truths and so you have these three types of truth if, if you wish to call it so and that creates what i would propose a more complete vision of reality in all its parts not just in uh, fragmented segments. You see, because in the world of empirical facts, we may never know if these things literally happened or not. But be discerning. And to make that point, I'll say the following. Foundational metaphysics are to be accepted because they've been attested to by countless saints, mystics, gurus, rishis, etc. I'm saying this as a, as a, proposition not as a as a you should accept them just because i said so but just if you if you were to accept them let's say these foundational metaphysics what foundational metaphysics the existence of the atma that we are ultimately an, an everlasting soul that is separate from our material bodies um that we are a part of uh brahman or bhagavan the supreme reality 
um, that pervades all things and that transcends all things, as well as being imminent. Uh, that reincarnation is a fact of, 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 of reality, that, every, that the human, that the Atma's journey is um, based on the principle of reincarnation and governed by the principle of karma, the law of karma, for example. So if we take these metaphysical substrates to be true, the idea that there, you are an Atma, you're a part of Brahman, you go through a process of reincarnation, you are governed by the law of karma, then that as a foundation allows you to give Puranic Hinduism, which is the Puranas are where you'll find the majority of the stories about the deities and their interactions with their various devotees and with each other. Puranic Hinduism then needs to be given much more credit as phenomenological truth in the sense that it speaks about experiences that we have and it shapes the way we think and act based on the existence of that metaphysical substratum and then if that is true if we're going through reincarnation and we have karma governing us and i am an atma and i am a part of bhagavan as a substratum and then i encounter these stories of the puranic literature and i extract all the the, the truth that I can from them that informs how I can deal with that metaphysical substratum, then I have a far, far greater degree of truth or value that I've extracted from this. And it isn't entirely dependent at all on whether it is empirically factually true or not. And yet at the same time, it doesn't mean that it can't be. You understand my point? So what I mean by that is that you have... Um, a corpus, a body of, of, of testimony of those who are mystics and gurus and saints who have said, this is the foundational grounds of reality. You are a soul, you come from God, etc. Et Things that we cannot prove or disprove, right? But let's assume that that is the substratum. Then you look at these stories that are in the, in the Hindu scriptures and you'll say, well, based on the presupposition that these substrates are real, that these metaphysical truths are self-evident, these things now start to inform exactly how I should operate within that reality, irrespective of whether they literally happened or not, and yet that doesn't deny the fact that they could have literally happened. Okay, that's, that's my, my first proposition in light of this part of the video. Let's move on to the second part. So if you read a profound book, like one of Dostoevsky's books, you could say of that book, and people often do, that it changed my life when I read that book. And a story that can change your life has a power that is best described as religious. And so religious is a kind of experience in some sense, rather in addition to a claim about what constitutes truth. And then those stories in Genesis, Cain and Abel, I think, and, and the story of Adam and Eve, because those stories are so deep that it's almost unfathomable. They get at the at the most profound of patterns. And so to say that they're literally true is actually to massively underestimate how true they are. Because you could tell me what you did this morning, and that would be literally true, but like, who cares? Whereas if you read the story of Adam and Eve, it's so true that it applies to everyone always. And mere literal truth can't do that. And we don't have a good language as scientists, let's say, as psychologists, or even as citizens, we don't have a good language for that kind of truth. True. What do we call that kind of truth? I was referring to it earlier as phenomenological truth, but, but that's just a, a sort of tenuous attribution. It's not really appropriate language to describe it. So I definitely agree with Jordan Peterson that, um, I mean, he sometimes calls this as meta-truth. Um, irrespective of what you call it, the point is very appropriate. Who cares? I was, I was touching upon this earlier. Who cares about trivial truths? The example he gave about, you know, you can tell me what you had for breakfast yesterday and so what? It's empirically true, but it holds very little value in in informing our human experience and how to act and how to shape our lives. Um, and that is infinitely less valuable than a story, however fictional it may be, that is true always and for everyone, as he puts it. And those stories are the rarest of stories, and I agree with him that those stories tend to be what we eventually term as religious stories. So one perfect example of that in the, the Hindu or Vaishnava corpus of, of, of scripture is Arjuna and Krishna's conversation in the Bhagavad Gita. You see, 
Chapter one, it's called Arjuna Vishada Yoga. It means the lamentation of Arjuna. What Arjuna plays out in that first chapter, what he thinks, what he's confronted with, what he says is always true for everyone. It's one such example of something that may be empirically true. It may have factually happened historically, no issues with that whatsoever, but far beyond that, much more interestingly and much more relevant is just how much that story speaks to a uh, universal canonical truth or experience about human nature and about humans. And I'm going to unpack that for you um, so that you understand what I mean when I say something like that. Um, so Arjuna was a real person speaking to the real Krishna. I'm, I'm not disputing that. So I can accept the, the, that it speaks a literal to a literal truth as well, although very difficult to to provide evidences to that. But as I said, it is the case that Arjuna represents all of humanity in that position, and Krishna is, is God, universal. And what can I extract from it? So let's let's do that. Let's do the the exercise itself. What is that which can be extracted from chapter one of the Bhagavad Gita that leads me to make the claim that I'm making that that story that may be fiction, although I'm not saying it is, is always true for everyone in such a way that it makes it 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times more true than an empirical factual story you may tell me about, you know, for example, someone and what they ate for breakfast a few days ago. What I can extract from chapter one is that life is a battlefield. And that is true for everyone. And we have to overcome our vices, our conditionings, our attachments. Why? To stand for what is right, for what is dharma, which means for purpose, for what is um, beneficial and purposeful and aligned with the, the, the ex- essential nature of being, of goodness, and so that which sustains our purpose of being, which we are positing in, in Vaishnavism as being love, we exist to love. We exist to experience love. Take that as a presupposition. If that is the purpose of our being, because I don't have time to map out the entire belief structure that leads to that conclusion right now, but let's just say that the presupposition is that humans exist to love and experience love. Let's say that is the fundamental, universal, ultimate, highest purpose of a human being because it's the highest experience that one can have, let's just contextualize it like that, then it is true of everyone that we have to support the the way of life and the principles that allow us to carry out that, that purpose, that allow us to love and be loved. And therefore we must fight on a battlefield called life, the vices and conditionings and ignorances and different things that prevent you from being able to love and experience love, from living out your fundamental purpose. And so that's true at all times and it's being mapped out exactly by the conflict of chapter one of the Bhagavad Gita. You see, in the in the Katha Upanishad, in book one, chapter two, verse one, it says the following, there are two paths, the good and the pleasant. Different indeed are their purposes, but both of them bind one. Of these two, it is well for one who takes hold of the good, but one who chooses the pleasant loses the very object of human life. And, and so that's, that's, that's me contextualizing what is happening on the battlefield. Arjuna, for those of you who aren't aware of the Bhagavad Gita in its context, I'm just going to paint a very basic picture. Arjuna is a prince, And he is on the side of good, part of the family known as the Pandavas. And they are essentially, again, this is very simplistic, standing for dharmic principles, righteous principles. Um, They are on the side of of virtue, all of this. Again, very simplistic. I almost feel bad explaining it this way, but it is how it is. And they are fighting. They've come. They've, their conflicts with uh, their cousins, known as the Kauravas, who stand for all that is, you know, arrogance, pride, negativity, vices, etc., cheating, the um, um, greed. All of these qualities are, are are sort of. Well, it's a bit of a caricature, but they are they are manifest in these individuals. They have been at conflict for a long time, and it's culminated in war. They're at a battlefield now. 
and Arjuna at the, at the beginning of this battlefield, the, the armies are assembled. He asks Krishna, who is God, who is acting as his charioteer, to take him to the middle of the battlefield so that he is positioned between the two armies of good and evil, yeah, to, to simplify it. And he will stand at the middle because he wants to see things clearly. He wants to see who it is that he's going to actually fight and confront. And so that's that imagery, that symbolism, that life is a battlefield, good versus evil, and that, and that you must stand at the point of neutrality in order to see truthfully what is what is actually, what is your state of being? What do you have at your disposal to fight with and what are you fighting against? Um, and this is only perceptible truthfully when you're in a position of an observer, of, of a neutral observer. And so that is that is something that Arjuna goes through. And all of this is going to then be addressed by Krishna functionally. Um, so after having this this need to stand in a neutral position between good and evil, what, what then can be extracted? The immense struggle that is fighting our own intrinsic parts, our negative side, because he looks at the car of us and they are his family. So he says, despite them being evil, they're my family. How can I fight them? And so symbolically, what does that mean? It's that despite recognizing your own vices, your, your, for example, your excessive pride, your excessive ego, your attachments and desires for things that are unhelpful to you, um, despite identifying those things as clearly being evil or not good for you, they're still yours. They're still a part of you. And you have extreme attachment to yourself. You have extreme... Um, affection, love even perhaps for all that you are. And that includes these bad parts. And so as much as you may call them bad and as much as you may show willingness to fight them, it's not so simple as to say, oh, okay, here are my, my negative qualities. I'm just going to smash them to smithereens and now I'm a good person. It's not that simple, right? And Arjuna is being confronted by just how difficult it can actually be. And so being met with our deep-rooted attachment to our own negativities because we have listened to that story inside our head for so long that to suddenly let go of it is difficult. Why? Because we are scared of the consequences of what might be if we do fight it. If we, as Arjuna is, is asked to end up fighting our own evil parts, there is a fear that, okay, my ego often sabotages me and treats me badly and, and causes me to treat others badly and leads to bad outcomes. So I should suppress it and fight it and dominate it. But if I do, will I perhaps lose other things? What, what do I stand to lose? What benefits do, my, do my, my ego bring to the table? What will I have to do to beat it? And what will that make of me? And, and so that fear of the consequence and the tendency that we have to project out into the future the worst case scenario and, and always see these doomsday scenarios. Um, that is being manifest by Arjuna in chapter one. That's why it's called Arjuna's Lamentation. He laments what he has to do and he laments what he sees, what he projects out as being the future consequences of his present actions, or his impending actions. And that is incredibly profound and incredibly deep to understand the human psyche, the, 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 the human experience when we are confronted with fighting the negative parts of ourselves and taking on that responsibility, carrying out that duty. And in doing so, how we can freeze to the point of abandoning our morals, our duties, our, our better nature. We create fearsome scenarios. We, we second guess ourselves. We even forget, for example, the fact that we don't exist in a, in a vacuum. We have an impact on others around us. So Arjuna, being a prince, he was one of the leaders of the Pandava army. And so his cold feet, so to speak, his emotional breakdown has a huge impact on all of the people that he is representing, that he is fighting for. But how that becomes a complete uh, non-topic, in a sense, in his mind, as he is arguing to Krishna why he should not engage in this fight. Because he's so wrapped up in his self uh, concern, so to speak, that he sacrifices things that he would otherwise stand for. And so you see how when you're faced with the beast of what you must overcome, the, the extent of the size of the negativity, and, and it's not, it's not um, a trivial point that the Kaurava army, the, the, the evil army, is far bigger than the Pandava army. 
the good army. And the only reason why the good army wins in the end is because they align themselves to God, to that which is the, the most true, to that which is the most good. Right? Krishna is, is on their side, rather because they choose Krishna, not because Krishna favors them. Krishna is available to all, but but the, 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 the Kauravas reject Krishna and the Pandavas accept Krishna, they choose Krishna. Right? That's the context of the story. And so, again, this isn't, I don't want to transform this video into uh, a dissection of the Bhagavad Gita. In fact, I, I hope to do this in the future and in, in another series of videos. Um, but again, I'm just showing you just how true this chapter one can be for so many people. And, and how can that ever be termed as false or a lie when compared to or when contrasted with uh, empirical truths that are utterly meaningless and speak nothing about the human experience um, that transcends the, the, the circumstantial events of that, of that uh, empirical um, act. And the culmination of all of this is um, when we are in need, as Arjuna is, he's in a state of lamentation and he's lost in chapter one, what is the solution? And it is to to take on your responsibility, you know, carry your cross, bear your burden of responsibility, all of that, which, you know, Jordan Peterson is famous for, for pushing people to do. But again, it's not like he invented this. But this isn't the point. The point is, is that even before that step can happen, there is a requirement of humility and acute self-awareness, self-knowledge to turn to help. And it's the human longing for a father figure, for a mentor, for a mother, for a friend, for God. There's a reason why when the child gets hurt, he cries for his parent. Because it's, it's the idea that when I'm lost and incapable of helping myself, when, I'm, when I li reach my limitations, either I, I, I factually have reached my limitations and therefore I need the help of another to take me beyond them, or I think I've reached my limitations when in fact I haven't and I need someone else to show me that what my, my perception of my limitations is false and actually I can go beyond what I have uh, wrongly attributed to be my limitation. And so that's where the guru figure, God figure, the father figure, the mentor figure, whatever you want to call it, has space to enter into one's life. And again, that is universally true of everyone at all times. And the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, verse 7, says the following. Arjuna speaks these words to Krishna. And again, in, in what I'm proposing, humanity speaks these words to God. With my heart overcome by weakness and my mind confused about my duty, I urge you to tell me clearly what is good for me. I am your disciple and I take refuge in you. Please teach me. So that informs to a degree that again is, is, is unfathomable that the right approach is acceptance of one's flaws and limitations, humility and offering of oneself to the one who is able to guide you out of this um, and that is God and everything that God embodies and, and that also I'll come to later that that includes things inside of yourself such as courage and strength and intelligence the tools that you will yourself use to pick yourself up out of the misery into into you know fulfillment but we'll come to that a little later um, I am your disciple I take refuge in you so to take refuge in all that is good, to take refuge in truth, which is what God embodies, to take refuge in love and to act out of that space. Please teach me. Allow yourself to be molded, to be shaped, to be taught by truth, by goodness, by love, by everything that God stands for so that you may overcome the limitations, the, the, the vices, the negativity, etc., that you also embody and that is represented in this story by the Kauravas that greatly seem to outnumber your positive traits. So again, um, I, I, as you can clearly see, there is plenty to be uh, extracted from what may in the end be a fictional story. May. yeah. And can we sit here and say, Therefore, that Arjuna's interaction with Krishna isn't true. To me, that's, that sounds insane. Okay, let's move on to the next part of the video. 
that's a domain of experience. You know, when you're captivated in a movie theater, when you're captivated by a story, when you're taken outside yourself, none of that has anything to do with logical argumentation. It's a whole different issue. And it, to me, it's tied very, very deeply to our ability to imitate and mimic. And so we're really good at that, way better than any other animal. We mi like language is mimicry. We use the same words. And so we're mimicking each other. And, but I can't mimic every person separately. I have to extract out from each person some essence of being that's admirable. And I do that person after person, and I try to imitate that. And then that core thing that's admirable that I imitate, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's psychologically equivalent to Christ. Whatever else Christ is, Christ is, that's why he's sometimes described as the king of kings. It's like if the king is the thing that's at the top of the hierarchy and then you look at all hierarchies and you take the thing that's at the top of all hierarchies of value, then that figure, when you see reflections of that figure anywhere, it produces awe and respect. So the Bhagavad Gita says in chapter 3 verse 21, Whatever an eminent person does, other people also do. Whatever standard that one sets, the world follows. So when Jordan speaks about mimicry, that human beings are creatures that mimic one another, and the best example of that, as he pointed out correctly, is language. Language is a process of mimicry. We, we hear language, we understand what it is um, attributed to, and then we mimic that language, and that's how we communicate. So absolutely, we are creatures that copy each other all the time. Krishna knows this, and in the Gita, he basically says, uh, whatever an eminent person does, so those whom we attribute a certain uh, authority to or status, others will copy. Um, whatever standard that one sets, the world follows. So the stories, with that in mind, the stories that are selected to enter into the corpus known as Shastra, because Hindu scripture contains a lot of stories, but it also omits a lot of stories. And that's actually a common theme with the Bible. The Bible also says that there are many more things that were done and said by Jesus that were not included in the, the, the Gospels. And so actually the Srimad Bhagavatam, for example, says the same. The Srimad Bhagavatam lists many incarnations of God and it actually goes on to describe many of the pastimes and activities and words spoken by those incarnations and interactions of those incarnations with other beings. But it also says, but the incarnations of the Lord are innumerable. Right, and, and it basically says, beyond what we have described here, there are many more. Yeah? And so, um, it means that there's a curation process undertaken, both for the Bible, for, for Hindu scripture, and I suppose others as well. The idea that what ends up entering into that holy book, that holy text, is selected. And you can say that, well, it's selected by human beings, um, most religious people wouldn't necessarily agree to that. I mean, from, from my stance in, in Hindu scripture, I wouldn't agree to that because the compiler of Hindu scriptures is said to be uh, Rishi Veda Vyas, and Veda Vyas is said to be an incarnation of God himself. So God incarnates to compile the accounts of his own activities. So that means God curates what is going to go into scripture and what is not. Okay. And why that is fundamental is because it means that the stories that were placed in these books are to be emulated. They have value in mimicry. That, that In reading them, you are informed about how you should behave, how you should engage with said stories. And they are not done so arbitrarily, but they are done so by God himself. And therefore, there is intentionality behind them. Um, they orientate our lives, they instruct our behaviors, they captivate us in profound ways. And so these stories that end up forming the body of, of, of religious literature, for example, the Srimad Bhagavatam, um, they end up being a compass that points north in our lives. And so those uh, are incredibly, um, they have incredible value because of their um example that they set and because we are creatures that have the tendency to mimic and, and emulate and copy those particular stories end up having extra value because if we copy those we will see that the outcomes that we achieve are 
of the highest nature. And that's what separates these texts from, I don't know, nothing comes to mind, but name any other fiction and you'll, that is not attributed to this religious status, for example. Um, and you can look at it, the, the accounts of, of uh, say, a historical, a historical book of the, of the accounts of the life of somebody who lived in um, the... 20th century and they maybe invented some great thing but then they just sort of died they ended up becoming miserable drinking a lot of alcohol and died in old age which by the way is the case of many of the world's most famous philosophers that a lot of their philosophical thought was driven by just how unsatisfied they were with life and how miserable they were some of the world's most exalted philosophers are actually by all standards of of, of measure terrible human beings but that's another topic for another video Again, the point being is if you study that life, you'll, you'll say there's almost no value to mimic this because I don't want the outcome that that person reached. But the Bhagavatam speaks of, of people who behave in a certain way in relation to God and reach outcomes such as transcendence, such as unconditional love, such as God consciousness. And so there is extreme value in mimicking those behaviors because it leads us to the same outcomes as the standard that people set others will emulate. That is Krishna's assertion. And then God himself goes and molds the stories that he wants you to consider as divine or the stories he wants you to reference to in a, in a way that separates them from all others because they will lead you to a result that is separate from all others as well. So a let's put it this way, something false can't lead you to something real. And so if the outcome of your mimicking these stories is real realizations or, or real um, states of consciousness, states of being, then that which, can, which led to that must also have a degree of, of reality to it, truth. What you experience in your subjective domain, phenomenologically, is real, right? Okay, um, the, the, I love this point he makes about taking the admirable essence of a being and emulating that. That, that is actually what he wants to mimic in people. You, you don't mimic the person, but you mimic the, the, an admirable essence of that person. And then you do that for many people and, and you start to embody admirable essence. And then he goes the extra mile and he says that Christ may be many things, but Christ is certainly that. He is that essence, that admirable essence of beings. Okay, well, I'll, I'll unpack that. But first, with the admirable essence of being, let's, let's look into that. I fully agree that the right way to mimic somebody the right way to extract value from somebody is not in copying the person, but in seeing what the person possesses, behaviorally speaking, what quality they possess or what habit they do or what is it that they have that is admirable that you look at and you say, I, I would like that. That is a value. That is great. And then you separate that from the person who has it. <clears throat> so you, you identify the admirable quality and you separate it from the one who possesses said admirable quality. And you, you mimic the quality, not the possessor of, of said quality. You, you put that quality on the altar of your heart. You, you worship the quality, not the person who possesses the quality. The reason for that is the following. Let's say you are looking to become more humble. And so humility is the, the essence that you are looking for, the admirable essence that you wish to mimic. And so what do you do? You look for humble people. But that's a mistake. You should be looking for humility. And those who possess humility will be termed as humble people. But what you're really interested in is humility. And so let's say that you, you, you find an individual that possesses humility. Take that demonstration of humility. Take those moments of humility and try to embody that essence, right? If you do the reverse, if you embody the person and say, I'm going to copy all that that person does because it so happens that they possess humility, you may be ignoring the fact that they may also possess many other things. That person may possess humility, but they may also possess jealousy, or they may also possess greed, or they may also possess something that you ought to stay away from. And so in mimicking the possessor of that which is admirable, you end up mimicking all that they possess, not just that which you ought to mimic. And so you need to make a separation because humility will never disappoint you, but a humble person might. You see, when you extract humility 
and you glorify humility, humility will never become arrogant because the minute humility becomes arrogant, it is no longer humility. So the thing which you call humility will always be humble and therefore you can, you can idolize it in a sense. But if you idolize a humble person, that humble person may have a change of heart overnight and become arrogant the next day. And then you have lost your reference. You have lost your, let's say, um, substratum of conduct. And that cannot be. And so I, I just, this is a long way of saying that I fully agree with Jordan Peterson's assessment that as mimicking creatures, we ought to extract the essence of these individuals. And he takes it a step further, as I said earlier, by saying that that essence is Christ. He's not wrong. The Bhagavad Gita says the same thing. Krishna is the essence of all those qualities. So um, let me give you a series of statements from, from Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. In chapter 7, verse 8, Krishna says, I am the valor in men. In verse 9 of the same chapter, he says, I am the life of all living beings. In verse 10, he says, I am the intelligence of the intelligent. In verse 11, I am the strength of the strong. So in doing this, Krishna is identifying himself with the essence of the possessors. So I am the strength of the strong. The strong is the possessor of the essence known as strength. Krishna is that essence. And so when we idolize the essence, when we try to mimic the essence, when we extract the essence, we are uh, uh, imbibing Krishna, imbibing God, associating with God, communion, communing with God. Yeah, so I, I could not agree more. And that is, a for me, a pivotal uh, truth about how we are meant to engage and interact with other people that an empirical event could never inform us, right? Um, he goes one step even further. Jordan Peterson says that Christ is often termed as the king of kings because he sits at top of all hierarchies. The king, A king sits atop a hierarchy and if he is the king of kings, then he is atop all hierarchies of value. Um, well, the entire chapter 10 of the Bhagavad Gita is essentially that. Arjuna asks Krishna the question, in what forms should I contemplate you? How should I conceive of you in this world? And Krishna responds in chapter 10 by, by listing out a series of hierarchies, tons of them. I'm not going to go through all of them at all. And he positions himself at the top of each of these hierarchies. And he says, that is one way that you can conceive of me, but I am much more than this, right? Um, for example, chapter 10, verse 21, Krishna says, of luminous objects, I am the radiant sun. In verse 24 of the same chapter, among reservoirs of water, I am the ocean. And in verse 30, he says, among that which controls, I am time. Now, why does he say these things? Well, it's clearly a, a behavioral point that he's making, a psychological point. It's not an empirical one. So it's not that Krishna is saying, I am literally the sun or I am literally the ocean. Um, it's that he is to be equated with all that inspires awe, all that is uh, at the top of their respective hierarchies, because psychologically, if we equate Krishna with all that sits atop of every hierarchy, if we equate God with that, or as Jordan Peterson does, he equates Christ with that, then the resulting experience in us as individuals, the resulting subjective experience that can become canonical if it is shared amongst many, is that it inspires awe, it inspires respect, it inspires um, a desire to commune with God, it, it factually manifests as communion with God. And if God, if Christ or Krishna embody everything that is good, everything that is good in its most perfect sense, then regarding that in that manner, appropriately places it on the pedestal of our life. And if I live my life with constant awareness and things that constantly trigger me and prompt me to think of that which is all good, that which is perfect, that which is my, my north pointing compass, right? Then I am living the most ideal life that is conceivably possible within my framework of belief. If I can look at everything that is around me in this world and associate all that is of power and hierarchy and, and sits atop of all this as being none other than God, then everything that would naturally inspire respect and appreciation and awe in me gets reattributed to the essence of that thing, which is God. And because God embodies all that is essential, all that is good, 
I start to commune with that. And the more I associate with that, the more I commune with that, the more I imbibe that. And there could not be a more ideal life to live to the theist which believes in this framework. And so these stories, Krishna saying, I am the ocean and I am the sun, although they factually are not true, well, partially, although they partially are not true, or, or certainly don't need to be accepted as true literally, they actually cause such a true consequence in me as the one who properly is able to position that claim and not take it at face value, but take it in interpretive value, that it molds my being so that my entire state of being becomes much more true and good and real than my mode of being would otherwise be in the absence of that truth. If I look at the sun and I see, oh, just some, you know, a ball of gas burning. Empirically true of no value to me, making no value, valuable, truthful impact in my being. But if I look at that and I think, of luminous objects, that is the greatest I can perceive. And that is Krishna, that is Christ, that is God. The, great, the greatest thing I can perceive is God. And what is God? God is love, God is justice, God is valor, God is intelligence, God is strength. And, and, and I am prompted to remind myself of this just by looking at the sun. Then I'm, by contemplation, by association, bringing these things into my life. And if I can do that, for not just the sun, but for almost everything in my life, then uh, you you suddenly have a situation where, oh, and by the way, just as a, as a point of detail, I'm not saying that the perception of God replaces the perception of sun. It is an addition to the perception of sun. So I'm not like, you know, you don't become some ungrounded person that starts flying in the clouds that you look at the sun and you go, oh, look, God. No, you, you, you say, oh, look, the sun, and then you attribute that to God, right? You attribute the value of God to it. Anyway, there's, there's much more that Krishna does in the Gita um, to that effect. He says he is the fragrance of the earth, he is the taste of water, etc., etc. The purpose being the same, which is to uh, orientate our life around communing with God and all that he stands for. So, to summarize and wrap up all of this that we have discussed, what I love about what Jordan Peterson does, but what I don't love is, <laughs> paradoxically, I love that he goes to the interpretive depth that he does and that he makes people more aware of the variety of truths that exist, not only empirical factual ones, but also, uh, as I said, phenomenological truths, uh, metaphysical truths that can be uh, um, hinted at or inferred by these truths that shape our life often far more than empirical truths does. And I love that he exposes that, he speaks about that, and that he uses these principles to extract as much meaning, to squeeze the, the juice out of the orange that is the Bible. What I don't like is that often some people who are newly introduced to this method of, of ascertaining truth then think that this is something that is exclusively applicable to the Bible. And that um, persons like Jordan Peterson and his influences like Carl Jung and others, because they are Western orientated individuals, it means that the West has the capacity to do this um, at the cost of others. And it's an exclusive claim. I'm not saying that they make that exclusive claim, but others make it on their behalf. And I resent that and I think that that's wrong. And I hope to have demonstrated today in this video, just the tip of the iceberg of how you can play that exact same game uh, to very powerful effect and to very beneficial effect with the Bhagavad Gita, with Hindu scripture in the Hindu framework. Um, and that Hindus may also look at this and think um, perhaps in a more nuanced way about the way that they encounter their own uh, tradition and scriptures as being a conjoining of uh, literal factual truths, empirical truths, metaphysical truths, um, phenomenological truths or meta-truths um, that point to one thing. Shastra contains all three of these because Shastra speaks to the truth of reality as a whole. And so when reality is to be apprehended in its entirety, all of these elements need to be contended with simultaneously.